Amen. Let's put our hands together and worship God. Let's invite Jesus to be here with us this evening by singing songs, magnifying God. Sing that song at the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden.
Sing that song, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Will I be washed?
here to, uh, you know, let's get a hold of God. Let's go into his throne room and ask amen. him for great things. Amen. God is here tonight. Amen. He really wants to help us. Let's pray for our leadership churches. First, the uh, church of Prescott, our grandmother church, uh, Pastor Greg and Lisa Mitchell. Let's pray for uh, Jesse and Bethany Morales. We also pray for the Cassios, the Galvans, the Hearts. Let's lift up uh, the Campos and the Ganeers in uh, Massachusetts, let's also pray for the Suspanskis, the Kings, and the Spicers 
in Jacksonville. And uh, let's lift up my pastor, Pastor Keith Sullivan, and uh, the uh, Rochester Church and all that God is going to do tonight in their service. Souls saved, miracles occurring, uh, backsliders reclaimed, and families added to the church. Let's believe God for miracle healings there too tonight and all that God is going to do in this week. Amen. With the discipleship of tomorrow night and the uh, grand opening uh, building dedication on uh, Friday night. Let's pray for a couple of grease needs here. A fellow by the name of Tripp. Amen. His father has back surgery. We're going to believe God to, for that. Miguel Nieves, Zach and Danielle, young couple, need direction from heaven. Let's also lift up Sheila Pink and Nick, a young uh, fellow by the name of Jacob and uh, Wilma and Angel Soda, amen, from the uh, Charlotte Beach outreach from a few yeah. weeks ago. Let's pray for miracles, amen. Perhaps there's a need in your life, a personal thing, an unspoken request, and you'd like to have us pray with you, amen. You're going to lift up your hand. God sees your hands, amen. Let's pray together and believe God for the miraculous and contend for God's hand to be upon this service. Brother David, why don't you pray for us when we subside? Amen. Let's pray to ch church. God, I thank you, God, for what you're about to do tonight, God. Heal, God, broken hearts, God, I pray. Work miracles, God. Loose the supernatural in this place, God. The Holy Spirit empower, Lord, God, I pray for our leadership churches. God, we believe you, God, for those that are sick and missing tonight. God, Diane and so God, bring up a quick recovery, God. We pray for Nate. We pray for all our converts, Lord God, all that you're doing. We pray, by God, for Barry's mom, Jean. We ask you for miracles in all these individuals, Lord God. Give them direction. Give them answers to prayer, God. Help them to serve you, Lord God. Revelation and baptize in the Holy Ghost, God, I pray. God, touch every life in this building tonight. Jesus, wonderful. We thank you, Jesus, for calling oh, us. We thank you for our power and us by your spirit. We thank you for the with your spirit as a guarantee. Lord, we know, Lord, that you have many plans before the end before you come and get us. We ask, Lord, that we be available for your use in that, Lord, so that your will can take place. In your name. Yes, let's praise God together. God, bring us to pass. God, help us. Lord, God, we want you to do that. God, we have your prize, God. Whatever we put our hands to, God, I pray, let it prosper. Amen. Praise God. Let's take a minute to greet one another. Make everybody feel welcome tonight.
to see everybody in church. Amen. Let's believe God for a great weekend. Amen. Upcoming days. A few announcements for the local church. And there's a discipleship tomorrow at 7 o'clock, I believe. And then Friday is the grand opening. If you could join us for that, that would be wonderful. We can represent Greece and uh, be part of our mother church as they dedicate their brand new building with Greg Mitchell on Friday night. Amen. We also want to remind you, if you're online and you haven't been aware of these uh, services, there's uh, Sunday, 1030. Amen. And uh, amen. There's a, a second service at night, 630. And we have prayer at 530. Amen. If you'd like to come and join us, we are open for business. Hallelujah. And uh, we have a midweek service at 730 on a Wednesday, uh, and then we pray at 6.30, trying to get a hold of God and find out what he wants us to do, because without him, we are lost. Amen. Amen. Right? So we're going to go ahead and uh, remind you about outreach. Saturday, we'd like to go door to door or to the mall or maybe down to the beach and share the love of Jesus. We had some great results. Last week, spoke to some People actually, there was a couple who came. I had like a, an odd uh, Thursday night outreach. I went on my own into a neighborhood, and this couple came from one of the houses. I talked to the gentleman, and they came on Sunday morning. It was pretty glorious. Oh, yeah. So we're thankful for that. Amen. Let's change the order of our service and take our offering. Amen. This is from Jude, uh, chapter 1, verse 16. And he writes, there are grumblers and complainers that walk according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling, flattering people to gain advantage. This sounds a lot like maybe the televangelists you watch on TV, or uh, people that are trying to gain your favor and trying to get you to be comfortable with them for, uh, uh, for evil reasons, amen. You might think of Jim Jones, who had a cult following uh, years ago in the 70s and uh, you know I think there was like 900 people that uh, drank the Kool-Aid but uh, he had misled them amen and he took advantage of them by flattering them and misleading them amen some of these preachers they never preach on sin they never preach on repentance they never preach on um, you know bringing people to the altar they never preach on uh, expecting people to give and so I'm going to ask you to give tonight, amen, and give what God requires, amen, the tithe is holy and offerings besides, amen. Let me ask the usher to come forward, if he can cobble forward. Can you make it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Praise God, amen. We appreciate David, amen, for his yeah. faithfulness throughout okay, the years. Okay, I don't want to lay down and take a nap. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lay down and take a nap. Take a bow. Here you go. Let's take the money. No matter what we're going through, you are strong and stable and yep. always the same, Lord. And we thank you that your promises are good, that you are completely trustworthy. And so we give to you with the assurance that you will use it for your purposes and blessing. In your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise God. The Lord bless you. And if you click the link online, you can make a donation. Amen. Let's sing that fast song at the cross. At the I got you thinking. Cross at the cross, we are first of life. And the burden of my heart will away. It was there by faith, I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. At the cross, at the cross, at the cross, we are first of life. Bibles, if you can read along, 
and Hebrews 9 verse 14 in a moment. In May 1924, a shocked nation learned that two young men from Chicago, Richard Leopold and Nathan Loeb, had killed a 14-year-old Bobby Franks. What made the crime so shocking and made Leopold and Loeb household names was the reason for the killing. The two became obsessed with the idea of committing the perfect murder and simply picked young Franks as their victim. They were caught and sentenced to life imprisonment, but Leopold was killed in a prison brawl in 1936. Listen why. He claimed that he wanted a chance to find redemption for myself and for others. There was a prison brawl. And Nathan Loeb, the other guy, became a hospital technician at his parole in 1958. He died in 1971. The question I have for you tonight is why do you think that this is going to help anybody by having yourself killed in a scrimmage there, or a, a fight, a brawl in prison? Why did he allow himself to be murdered for a prison brawl? Many people carry the guilt of past crimes with them, and they try to somehow pay uh, God back or pay other people back. It is like a ghost that haunts them every day. It shades their character, darkens their view of the world, and gives them a jaundiced eye about everyone. They carry this guilt with them like a ball and chain. It keeps them back from enjoying life, from enjoying relationships. Let's look tonight at the issue of guilt and the pros and cons and how we can deal with it. How to resolve it the biblical way. Amen. Hebrews 9, 14. Paul's right here. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. Cleansing our consciences is something that good works is not going to do. By donating more money to the United Way or kids over, you know, trying to make yourself feel better. Maybe you're going to give money to the guy who's hobbling along at the traffic light, you know, begging for money or looking for, you know, you throw a few coins in his little cup. Sometimes we try to do these things to, to alleviate that sense of guilt that, you know, always is, is overshadowing us. Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, verse 16, he's talking about having a good conscience with people that are outside the church or people in your life maybe so that when we, he says, when we get defamed as evildoers, that those who revile you, your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed, that they will be ashamed because, hey man, you are free you are a different person. You're not going to act that way anymore. And people have got nothing on us. You see, guilt is not a good motivator. Some people like to play the Holy Ghost or the devil. They try to make you feel bad. Try to get you to do things out of condemnation. But you owe me. Many times people will put you down uh, playing on your conscience. This is not any way to get people to come to church, make them feel bad, or get them to come to more church, or get them to pay more money in the offering. You know, it, it doesn't really work. Or try to get them to go on outreach. It doesn't work. You're trying to shame somebody into doing something. It may work for a very short time, but it's the wrong motivator. Amen. The wrong reason for doing good. 
You know, just like we shouldn't be doing good things to get rewards only, right? But we should be doing good to other people because we're Christian and we should love other people. We're not doing it out of guilt, trying to be good and help people. Go on outreach, pass a thousand flyers out, you know? There's no way you can remove that sin from your life or that guilt. You feel sorry for the Jehovah Witnesses that are just... They don't give up, man. They're not going to endorse. Many of them believe that their salvation is linked directly to their evangelism. We don't believe that at all. And then the Christian doesn't live in fear. We don't live our lives out of guilt. Guilt is there to prick our conscience, make us feel like there's something wrong that's going on. It makes us uncomfortable. Amen. If you never get convicted in a service or you feel like you're guilty maybe once in a while when the scriptures come forward, then, hey, man, we should bow down to you probably, right? Because all of us have sinned. All of us fall short. And so, you know, we've all uh, been convicted in a, in a service. I myself thousands of times throughout the years. Amen. Guilt makes us feel like there's something wrong, makes us uncomfortable, gets us to wake up and see what's happening. Whatever it is, if, you, you know, if, if you're mistreating your wife or your parents or somebody you know, you're, you're, you're using the wrong words, you're looking down on them, you're mistreating people, the preachings comes forth and bam, you're pegged, you're convicted. That's you. The Spirit of God is talking about you. So that you can change. Not to just make you feel bad. Not to push you down. The guilt of, that we experience could be like a screaming siren in our ears. Or it could be the quiet whisper of a dove. Amen. We need to understand guilt first. If we're going to uh, let it have its work inside of us. So that we can become better people. But also if it's. On a, uh, if it's overamped, if it's on overload, if we're not able to carry it, give that guilt over to Christ, and then we're going to suffer in that. We have to understand it because it can be a good thing. When we do something wrong, our conscience is pricked. Yes, we are guilty. We know that it is wrong. We know that we should change. Guilt can be good. Amen. The kind of guilt that is useless is the guilt that is not from God, that God's not showing you when you make mistakes. Let's look first at no guilt in the world. And this is the New Age doctrine that you've heard uh, time and time again, where, uh, you know, the world says uh, anything goes, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? This is the way we can live. Sexual perversion is good. Any kind of immorality is fine. If you want to divorce your wife, just call and get a complimentary co consultation and we'll help you do that. The world says that there's nothing wrong. You're not doing anything out of line. Pornography is okay. Fornication is all right. Having many uh, different spouses or marriages, you know, uh, Drug use is at an all-time high also. They've legalized marijuana. They don't know how to tax it yet or sell it, but it's legal now. Prescription medication. It's okay for you to take drugs. They're legal. Your doctor said they're fine. Hasn't the drug world, the, uh, you know, these people, these drug companies have duped us. They're making billions of dollars off of Millions of Americans that are on prescription medication. They're duped on drugs. Right? Heroin and fentanyl, illegal drugs, are claiming many lives every day. Percocet. Amen. It's getting laced with it now. They're trying to get people addicted to drugs. They're trying to make it okay. Or they're trying to give away free needles. It's okay that you're a heroin addict. It's fine, just come and we'll help you to kill yourself, right? That's what they say. 
It's okay. It's new age doctrine. I heard Black Lives Matter organization is being sued for fraud. Anybody hear that? No. The problem with our country is not systemic racism. It's systemic covetousness and greed. And they are responsible for that. Money is the root of all kinds of evil. What they're saying is it's okay to take donations from people and then go buy homes and squander it your own way. And there's no guilt there. You can do whatever you want. You can steal money from people. Those people in the Bible are called thieves. Taking money from people without regrets or without guilt is what's happening in our world today. The first commandment of the Satanic Bible is anything you want to. Do what thou wilt. It's even in the King James for some reason. I don't know how you pulled that one off. Well, right? Mm -hmm. Do whatever you want. And there's no repercussions. There's no consequences. Do whatever feels good. That is the whole of the law, he said. So these are faulty phrases. And I, this is written by somebody much smarter than me. Maybe you can click with this. But I think it's important for us to see these two phrases. He says, there are no absolutes. And the second one is like it. The truth is relative. Wow. <laughs> there are no absolutes written by Jared Kennerick. The truth is relative. Each phrase implies and necessitates the truth of the other. An absolute is something that is universally true. That is, its truth is independent of all other factors and context. To say there are no absolutes is to say there are no independent universal truths. All truths are therefore dependent. The truth is relative, makes exactly this claim. Philosophically speaking, that which is relative is dependent on something else. Is no right or wrong, no absolutes. So it just doesn't make any sense. Amen. Criminals are on the rise. They're being released uh, from their bail or whatever. They do a crime. They're back on the streets. Politics, they're climbing above the law. There's no remorse for these heinous crimes, slandering your opponents, right? There is no guilt that they feel. It's okay. That's just, hey man, this is what we do. It's politics. That's their justification. People are getting away with murder, literally. And they're getting away with perversion. Seemingly, for a while, sin is fun for a season, of course. It lasts, but there will be a judgment. You see people uh, down on Park Avenue in, in the riots in 2019 or uh, you know, George Floyd and uh, Black Lives Matter and they were just tearing up the tables. No problem. It's okay, you can do that. You're a little upset, I guess. People get away with everything today. We can do whatever we want to. There's no limits, there's no laws. Therefore, we cannot be judged as guilty. We don't feel it. Divorce is good if your partner does not satisfy you anymore. Just move on to the next one. Or if they're not helping you self-actualize. Helping you to achieve fulfillment. Everything is now being taught against the Bible and against common sense. Can I hear an amen out there? Amen. Everything is the opposite of what the Bible teaches. People are not thinking rightly anymore. They have no conscience and they feel no guilt. Amen. This is a serious problem. So we also find that Satan is ruling here. He's ruling this world. The devil is saying, go ahead. Go on, do it if you want to. There's no standards of morality. There are no absolutes of behavior. There are no standards of righteousness. Everybody can do whatever they want to. People you know on your job or if you start talking about the Bible, you can't judge me. You can't tell me I'm wrong. You can't say that. That's hurtful. It's not me, ma'am. It's the Bible. The Bible says... 
So let's look at Genesis 3, 1 for just a minute here. Now the serpent was more cunning than the, any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So the devil is working overtime now through media, through posts, through uh, anything you find on the internet, amen? And he's trying to get us to rethink, what did God say? What did God really mean when he said A, B, and C? We question what is right and wrong. We question what the Bible teaches is moral. We don't care that there are, no conse that there are consequences for our disobedience until we realize that we are naked, just like Adam and Eve. They were lied to. They were deceived in the garden. And the devil removes absolutes. And he says so in deception, do whatever you want to. And then he tries to erase the judgment. But it's impossible to. Amen. Let's lighten it up for a minute here. A man went into a bar. He bought a glass of beer and then immediately threw it at the bartender's face. Quickly grabbing a napkin, he helped the bartender dry his face. Then he apologized with great remorse. I am so sorry, he said. I have this compulsion to do it. I fight it, but when I don't know what to do about it. You better do something about your problem, the bartender replied. You'll be sure I'll remember you and never serve you another drink until you get help. It was months before the man... Uh, faced the bartender again. When he asked for a beer, the bartender refused. And then the man explained that he had been seeing a psychiatrist and that his problem was solved. Convinced it was okay now to serve him, the bartender poured him a drink. And the man took the glass, slashed the beer back again into the bar, a barkeeper's astonished face. I thought you were cured. The shocked bartender screamed. I am, said the man. I still do it, but I don't feel guilty about it anymore. <laughs> Some people blame their mistakes on other people. It was the way I was raised. It was my parents. I didn't get to ride a pony when I was a little boy, and that's why I am the way I am. You can blame it on other people. Your resources, you don't have enough money to be good, or we deflect that guilt Unto other people, it's other people's fault. Amen. Let's look secondly at the promise that we find in our scripture, and that is that we can be free of guilt, but for a good reason. Amen. The Bible says that uh, if you confess, you will be forgiven. Amen. I, I would probably guess that, you know, people in the world are like, that's too easy, or that's not fair. How can you just say, I'm sorry, and God washes all your sins away? I can hear people mocking you or mocking the, the gospel. It seems so simple because it is simple. Confess guilt, and then you can be cleansed. This is the pattern. 1 John 1, verses 9 if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's something powerful that's released, firstly, when we recognize that we have been involved in a crime. We've done something wrong, something against our conscience, something against God, and we're able to recognize it. Most people are living in denial. They say that it never happened or it's not a bad thing. Uh, it doesn't really mean what you think it does. And they don't want to admit their wrongdoing. Lastly, the forgiveness is granted to the defendant when they admit wrongdoing. They surrender to God. They admit it. Yes, that was me. When we honestly, in humility, see that we have erred and we seek forgiveness, we will be cleansed. Amen. There is a stain that comes upon our sins or upon our immorality or our unfaithfulness or even our unbelief. There's a filth 
that is attached to that. It is more than just a little mistake. Oopsie, I slipped, right? It's, you know, more than a, a, a little spill of wine on a white carpet, but it is like bloodshed. It is a crime. It is a serious offense that has happened. And if you're going to call it, if you're going to just change the name of it to something else, then you're not free. Guilt is a good thing. Secondly, sensing personally that you have done wrong brings it to our attention, causes us to become aware of it, wrong of our uh, aware of our wrongdoing. Guilt has its place. It is a good thing if the person doesn't want to repent because it will keep reminding them, you know, what you said. You remember what you said? And they try to escape that, that bad feeling about that thing that they're being reminded of that. Amen. Until they finally repent and say, yes, that was wrong. And so for the, the Christian, you know, you know, we bring our sins to God. We uh, bring, you know, we make confession, not, not to a priest like in the Roman church, but we're able to cast our, our burdens and our sins upon Jesus and he erases them. And then the next step is to, you know, we can, we can go and make it right with people when we've offended them. That's the pattern that the Bible teaches us. So it's kind of like, you know, the icing on the cake when, you know, after you have been convicted by sin and you're feeling guilty, that you kind of give it over to God, but then there's an act that you can follow through and, you know, repair the damage that you've done, hopefully with other people. We can't just continually live our lives offending people and then, you know, try to make up with them over and over again. Try to do good, mend our ways. And some people are just, they're sad or they're convicted because they got caught. Right. Not because they really want to do something about it and they want to change. They're just mad at God for bringing it to their attention. So now we think we have to pray more. If I go to church more, if I go on outreach, maybe I'll be a better person. And that guilt can be taken away. Guilt is also harmful if it's not dealt with properly or if it is ignored. Because the behavior, whatever negative, uh, evil, wicked thing that you're doing or people are doing, it will be continued and it will be going on. It will never cease. Relationships will be harmed. If you're just playing religion, or if you're just playing the hypocrite, like you put a mask on your face and you pretend that you know, you're good, this is not going to cut it before God. I mean, that kind of lifestyle is a waste of time. God gives us a conscience so that we can become aware of what is moral and what is good. And when we fail that we can change. Thirdly, I want to look at ignoring your conscience. A lot of people get into some serious problems ignoring their conscience. If we ignore our guilt, we cover it up, our conscience, or pretend everything's okay, that's when we get deeper into trouble. Many of you know that pain is a good thing. It shows us that there's something wrong putting your hand uh, near the stove, it's going to be painful. You can scream at your kid, but until they do it, they don't really fully realize the danger of heat and fire. Amen. They don't know that it's something wrong, something dangerous and painful like your hand on the stove. So some of you know about leprosy. The problem with leprosy is that you lose your feeling in your extremities, your fingertips, or your, your nose, your ears, your toes. And when uh, you, you, you stub your toe or something starts uh, bleeding, you, you have no awareness of it. You're not aware that something's wrong. And so this is why leprosy is very dangerous because you can't feel it. Amen. The devil also brings up your past. He likes to move it into overdrive. He's called the accuser of the brethren. And he goes before God 
and he questions your motives. They didn't really mean that. The devil goes overboard before God accuses you of things that you've done and even things that you haven't done, messing with your mind. And then things that you've done, you've slipped up, you've messed up, you've sinned. The devil is aware of these things. And what he does is he likes to capitalize on it. And he, he, he reminds you about what you did, you lousy scumbag. And he keeps reminding you about what you did wrong. He loves to do that. He controls you. He can manipulate you, mess with you. Amen. Especially Christians. Many Christians in here, you want to please God. You want to do good. And so you feel like, wow, I can't believe I did, did that. And I think that women might err on this side a little bit more than men. Men are like, who cares? I don't care what I say, right? We're quick to put our foot in our mouth. But women are uh, tender-hearted. Women are a weaker vessel, the Bible says. And so they may feel the weight of guilt more than a man. If I could be sexist in here for a moment. So... Amen. The devil loves to play in your mind, ladies, and make you feel extra worse. It can be devastating and discouraging because you're being reminded of your mistakes all the time. When God says to you, I don't remember them doing that. God says, all I see when I look at their lives is the blood. I see the blood of Jesus. They're my child. They're, they're mine. They've been blood bought. I'm not going to, you know, remember them like that. I remember them differently. I'm not going to think like them. Devil, you can be gone right now. The devil goes on, on and on and on. He's exaggerating that shame. Reminds you of the things that you've done over and over again. Maybe it never even really happened. Maybe, maybe it was unreal or imagined in your own mind. But still, the devil will capitalize on it. He'll use it. Amen. You ever meet somebody who is continually apologizing for, I'm sorry, did I, did I hurt your feelings? Do you know anybody like that? They just go, and they just want to, to be perfect. I'm sorry, honey, you can't be perfect. You're gonna make a mistake once in a while. They don't want to offend you. That's a problem because they're not really focusing on real issues. And they will never do it. <coughs> Some people are hyper sensitive like that. The Bible says we need, I don't know if it says it in the Bible, but there's a saying that we like to remember, and that is to have the height of a, a rhino, but the tenderness, the heart of a baby. Right? So sometimes you just have to, you know, you just have to be able to be resilient. Uh, to some, you know, some people saying some things about you, maybe. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit convicts our conscience. And I'm reading here in John 16, verse 7. Jesus is teaching here, nevertheless, I tell you a truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I do depart, he's talking about being crucified and going back to the Father. If I don't depart, I... Uh, the helper can't come. But if I do, I will send the helper to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you will see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit has a working inside of our conscience. Now you can harden your heart or you can... You know, say, you know, I'm not going to let that affect you. I'm not going to let that affect me. I'm, some people have a heart of stone. Like, they, they can't be penetrated. They can't be, uh, you can't tell them anything, really. They, you try to, you know, you show them pictures of people starving in India, and they're like, whatever. You know, some people just can't be affected. Like, they're just, they're hardened. Amen. They cannot be convicted. But the Holy Spirit to the Christian is Somebody we let inside of us to show us where we are lacking, where we are uh, falling into sin, where we're getting off track. And it's very helpful to be convicted by the Holy Spirit <coughs> if you want to be discipled, 
if you want to make an impact in your generation. Fourthly, we read about Saul on the road to Damascus, Acts 26, 14. It's, it's interesting here, I think it's Luke writing the book of Acts, but he says, we all fell to the ground. And I heard a noise, a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And he's talking about the conviction that the Holy Spirit was trying to get Paul's attention, but Paul was like, no, I'm not listening to you. You know, the goats are the, uh, like the spurs in a cowboy's boots to get the horse to move. And Paul was like, no, I'm not, I'm not budging. Paul denies his conscience. He's ignoring the guilt as he's dragging people to prison and seeing others murdered and tortured, families split up, Christians being persecuted, and he's just, he can't enjoy life. He can't enjoy relationships. Some people can't sleep at night because they're tormented. Their consciences are guilty. And they're not ready to change or repent. Lastly, the Apostle Paul, he's found fighting against God, and that is a dangerous battle to fight. If you're going to be fighting against the Holy Spirit conviction, in other words, God is trying to get a hold of you and you're not budging. You're digging your heels like, I am not moving. God, you cannot change me. You can't tell me what to do. Right? This is a dangerous battle to fight. Why? Because God's arms are longer than yours. Right? <laughs> you might as well just surrender. Praise God. Judas ignored Christ's plea at the last minute. Some of you have read that scripture where they're at the Last Supper and uh, he says to uh, Judas, you know, do what you got to do. He's giving him one last, he knows what he's about to do. He's aware of all things, right? But even at the Last Supper, he's exposing Judas. He's giving him another chance. He's offering a, a way out of this incredible, this horrible betrayal. But Judas rejects the love of Christ. He rejects his, his trying to lead him out of what he's about to do, which is like total damnation. There's no turning back when you turn to Christ. And instead, Judas deals with his guilt. How? By hanging himself. He commits suicide. He's not going about it the right way. Well, we have Peter on the same, uh, in the same chapter. Peter is healed because although Peter denied knowing Christ, he was able to kind of deal with it after a while. Peter, uh, the big mouth, he says to Jesus, Lord, if all betray you, I will not. And Jesus says, oh, really? You're going to, okay, let's see what happens here. Tonight before the car crows, twice you will have denied me three times. So we find the picture on the beach as Jesus is risen from the dead and they're fishing. Peter's with the other guys and they, uh, you know, come up and they're, they're cooking some, uh, you know, some fish and, uh, and they're kind of fellowshipping together. And Jesus restores Peter at that time. Peter, dost thou love me more than these? And so he deals with him and he reaffirms his relationship with him. Peter is healed. But he finds forgiveness on the beach there as Jesus ministers to him and affirms his love towards him because he was a friend. And lastly, in that interaction there, he reconfirms his ministry Right? You need to go, amen, and be a leader. And we see, you know, Peter's leadership in the New Testament church is highly regarded and he's honored because he chose to repent. He chose to follow Jesus. Let's look lastly at the resolution, amen, of a guilty conscience, and that is your healing. That is always the desire of God to bring about healing in your life. The conviction and the, the preaching of the gospel is to 
disciple you, yes, and train you and teach you, yeah, not, not just to make you feel bad. Look how you're, you know, you're, you're lacking in this area here. The Holy Spirit and God, they're not uh, desiring to make you feel condemned and put down. Look at the lousy job you did there, you know. It's not, that's not a job. The, the, the desire of God's Spirit is to make you better, to make you see the error of your way so you can be cleansed in your conscience. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. <coughs> Jesus' works were pure. Jesus' sacrifice was eternal. He was innocent. You know, you try to compare your works to Jesus' works, and they're just, they're and totally different. Different universes, man. You can't compare them. So if you're trying to live by your works and by your good deeds, amen, it's not going to happen. Your confidence, your affirmation comes from Jesus taking his blood and washing you clean, washing your conscience clean so you can serve God the right way. Mahatma Gandhi is fasting to protest the riot killings that followed the partition that created Hindu India and Muslim Pakistan in 1947, a fellow Hindu approaches to confess a great wrong. I killed a child, says the distraught man. I smashed his head against a wall. Why, asked Mahatma. They killed my boy. The Muslims killed my little boy. They killed my son. Gandhi says, I know a way out. Find a child, a little boy whose mother and father have been killed, and raise him as your own. Only be sure he's a Muslim, and that you raise him as one. Mm. But what a selfish reason to raise a kid, to, you know, cleanse your own conscience by doing a good work. What a selfish reason that we would be to relieve yourself of the guilt because you murdered another little boy. Some of you were raised in the Roman church. Amen. I know I uh, did the confession and all that, right? And so the Bible doesn't have anything to do with really, really like penance. Penance, we were taught penance as good Catholics. Penance is not the way of the Bible. Penance is man's way. It's impossible for us to pay for our sins. It's impossible for us to find relief in exchanging uh, our sin for good works. There's no, that doesn't really work in the spiritual realm. It's impossible. Or trying to do some work to pay for wrongdoing in the past. Penance is defined as a voluntary self-punishment inflicted in an outward expression of repentance for having done wrong. In each, the word penance is used only once in the passage in the Bible. You humble yourselves, he writes, in scripture by going through the motions of penance. You bow your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think that it will please God? That's from Isaiah 58, 5. Religious rituals will not expunge your guilt for sin and wrongdoing. No actor, no deacon, no uh, pastor can ever uh, compensate for offending people and offending God, especially what is needed is repentance. Amen. We can't cleanse our own conscience by doing good works. That is impossible. We can never pay back God. There's never enough that we can do. What we can do is to repent. Move away from sin. Move towards Jesus. Because Jesus was without spot unblemished, he gave the perfect sacrifice without hidden motives, without hypocrisy. Jesus' finished work on the cross completes your salvation. And by faith, your faith in his blood and what he's accomplished at the cross will cleanse your conscience so that you can serve God. It will remove the guilt. It's the blood 
that makes you free. Jesus' blood can free your mind. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. God will free you from the chains of a guilty conscience and cleanse you and make you right with God. Amen. What a joy it is to be saved. Amen. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Thank you for the cross, Lord God. I thank you for redemption. Awesome is our God. Powerful. Amen. I'm going to encourage you to come to the cross where the blood flows. Let's bow our heads and uh, give an opportunity to anyone here. You're not saved. You're not a Christian. You've never been born again. You've been carrying a guilt uh, with you for your entire life. And you've never learned how to give your sins to Jesus and have your conscience cleansed. What a glorious what a wonderful thing when we read, when we have revelation, we understand why Jesus died. And that act of, of giving him your burdens, casting your sins upon him is revolutionary. If you're not saved, I'm going to encourage you to pray tonight. Give your life to Christ. Turn away from sin. Repent of your old life. The Bible says, that God will make you a new creation. Old things are passed away. When we believe simply like trusting in Jesus. As a little child will trust his father. Amen. We can have our sins taken off of us and put on Jesus by faith. And understand that he is available here for you tonight. Amen. He's died for your sins. Amen. He shed his blood 2,000 years ago in advance as an investment, something to get your attention. Though we are involved in sin, though we are guilty, then God says, I will forgive you. I will wash you in my blood. How many tonight want to be saved? Want to give your life to Christ? You've never prayed uh, at an altar. You've never confessed your sins and you've never had a conversion experience. Amen. And that's you tonight. You would like to pray and let this night go down in history. Amen. A change in your life. A change in your conscience. Amen. How many would there be? You're not saved. Or maybe you're backslidden. You're not right with God. You're walking in a different direction. You're ignoring the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to slap you in the face, but he is going to draw you out of your sin, out of this world, out of the insanity of trying to do things your own way. And he wants to cleanse your conscience tonight and give you a new life. Amen. You're not saved or you're backslidden. With an uplifted hand, you want to make tonight your night of revelation. Praise God. Your night of cleansing cleansing your conscience. What a glorious experience that is for every individual. And I praise God if that's you. You raise your hand online. We'd like to pray with you. We have a church here that is going to pray with you and we're going to believe God for your conversion tonight, for your cleansing of sin. Amen. You're watching tonight. I'm going to ask you to remove all obstacles, distractions, and close your eyes and pray this prayer and mean it tonight. And repent of your sins and everything will change for you. God will give you a new mind, a new way of thinking about life. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I am sorry for my sin. I'm done living this way. Thank you for the cross and the blood you shed. And I ask for a miracle tonight. I want to be converted. I want to become a new creation. I'm going to let old things pass away. And all things become new. I repent. I turn away from sin. And I let my old life die. 
Tonight, I will live for Christ. I thank you for this opportunity. And I thank you for this prayer. In Jesus' name. And praise the Lord. Let's change the order of the service. Open up the altars if you'd like to pray. We're going to sing a song here. I fix my eyes on you. What am I not Bless you. Have a great week. Amen. Back in school.